Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the France 24 debate where today, no surprise, we're focusing on the induction of famed Franco-American Josephine Baker to the Pantheon here in Paris. French President Emmanuel Macron has just presided over a ceremony which celebrated the life of an extraordinary woman who led an exceptional life. She's the first American, first woman of colour and the first ever performing artist to be honoured in the monument. Rappelle-toi Paris Quand j'ai chanté J'ai deux amours J'avais fait le Paris Josephine Baker did not defend a particular colour of skin. She carried an ideal of mankind. And she fought for the freedoms of each and every person. Her cause was that of universalism, the unity of the human race, universal equality before individual identity, emancipation against discrimination. She fought for dignity. She fought for everyone. Joining me today to talk about Josephine Baker's legacy and what it means for contemporary French society are Curtis Young, a historian and professor of literature at Essex Business School, Ajari Aoki, an American a Nigerian author and founder of Madame la Maison, a Paris based homewares company, Cheryl Ann Bolden, an artist curator at the museum Precious Cargo who's rushed here to join us from the Pantheon, I believe. But first, Olivia Salazar-Winspear takes a look back at what indeed was an amazing life. She had two loves, two countries and one incredible life. Her story is at the centre of the play Josephine B, which shows how a little girl from a poor family in Missouri went on to become an international star and a brave, independent woman. Josephine Baker embodied freedom. She was provocative, beautiful and funny. She was also a woman of convictions. By 1940, the music hall star had conquered French audiences, but she wanted to help liberate them too. She was an important part of the French resistance. She said it herself. I put microfilms and my sheet music or in my bra. My dressing room was open to those collecting intelligence. She was decorated for her efforts and took those medals all the way to Washington, where she joined another struggle marching for civil rights in the footsteps of Martin Luther King. At the same time, her fight against racism continued back in France at her home in the Dordogne, surrounded by her family, made up of children adopted from different countries around the world. Et à côté de Jean-Claude, qui est... Brahim. Il vient d'où? D'Algérie. Fifty years later, Brahim remembers an unconventional but loving childhood. He was the seventh of Josephine Baker's 12 children, who she called her rainbow tribe. We were a multi-ethnic, multicultural family, but we were all brought up together in the same way, to show the whole world that when you raise young children together, a truly universal sense of fraternity is possible. It's not just a utopian dream. 
Committed to her own utopia and to freeing France, Josephine Baker's achievements are now carved in stone in the Pantheon. Cheryl Ann, Josephine Baker is the first woman of colour, the first American, the first performing artist to be inducted into the Pantheon. It's significant on so many, many levels, but what does it mean for you? Oh, personally, this idea of self-esteem, that she had courage. And also at the March on Washington, I was five years old, and I don't remember her personally, but I do remember the energy. The fact that she had a dream and she had to move, she had opportunities that came her way and that she did what she had to do. And so I believe on a spiritual level, for me personally, that she had to really reflect on what she had to do in her life and how she saw herself in the future. Curtis? Um, yeah, I was, that's, I was so, so taken by your response. Um, Josephine, um, as, as, as the president said, she's so, so represented universalism, but, uh, but the thing that, that really strikes me about Josephine Baker again is how she constructed her life and, how she, and, the, and the material that she used to construct her life were all of the adversities that she faced. It speaks to that resilience that's part of the African-American experience across the board. This is a girl who was, was sexualized at a very early age, uh, 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 brutally treated from eight years old. And when she came to France, she took all of that, rather than being a victim of it, she took all of that and used it to, to create uh, a sensation. She came on the stage with the Revue Negra, uh, avec, with, uh, uh, with this tall, dark black man, barely clad, with him holding her over her shoulders, uh, completely, she was basically nude. She was, she was wearing something, but it was, it was so flimsy, she might as well not have had it. And, and this caused a sensation in the theater of the Champs-Élysées that it had not experienced since Stravinsky's Rite of Spring had opened there, which also, again, broke a, a certain mold and created an extraordinary sensation. And then she went on to construct, use, the, use that material to construct a personage uh, that, that just spanned the globe. Universalism really is Josephine Baker. Uh, Jerry, as a young girl growing up in the States, did you know much about Josephine Baker? To be very honest, no, I did not. Um, you know, I grew up in Austin, Texas, and I didn't know, you know, nobody was talking about Josephine Baker where I lived in Austin, Texas. Um, I think, you know, later in life, you know, after I'd come to Paris the first time, my stepmother told me about getting to perform, you know, as a children's choir behind Josephine Baker, and this, you know, really stuck with her, and it meant so much to her. But, you know, before that, I, you know, no one was talking to me about who she was or or her greatness in, in any way. So watching the ceremony, I felt immensely you know, proud to see this woman um, re um, recognized in this way. Uh, Curtis, President Macron decided in July for this uh, to happen mm -hmm. after, I mean, it, it went back some eight years, but mm -hmm. there was also a petition that was presented to him. But I want to know, why did it take such a long time? Uh, the, the whole idea, I, the, for me, the whole idea of... of Pantonization is is uh, is extraordinarily complicated because it touches on every nerve of the country, uh, and and no matter who it is. I mean, I, I, for example, uh, Zola. They they had to take him into the Pantheon on a Sunday when everybody was away in the holiday uh, at night because there was so much uh, controversy about him around the Dreyfus uh, uh, incident, for example, in in Jacques. Uh, and so, so it's it's an incredibly delicate move to 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 bring someone into Pantheon, and and now we're talking about a person that was not born in France, which is going to touch on a, a, a lot of nerves. Indeed, uh, Jerry, um, when you look at this extraordinary woman, what message does this ceremony send not only to people in France but across the world? Um, I would say that, you know, 
again, I take it back to this idea of like rec uh, recognition and representation, you know, across the world. For me, you know, to see this woman, who this black woman, who was who celebrated in this way across the world in in places where people might not know that she exists, I think representation is so 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 important. And even though I know it's very controversial, you know, her, you know, being pantheonized, I. I'm not sure. How We're going for the word immortalized. <laughs> <laughs> immortalized. Um, I know it's controversial, but, you know, I think as a, as a young black person, you know, and I definitely told my daughter to turn the TV on, you know, it's, it's great to have models and to see other faces, brown faces mm -hmm. that are recognized and respected, even if, even if this is controversial in so many ways. So I think that does send a message to the world, you know, there's a you know a whole nother conversation about you know what that means for France, but as, and, and as we're going to touch on that yeah. later because <laughs> what I want to do is sort of chronologically just go through the various parts of Josephine's life. I mean, she had many lives, mm -hmm. but you know, let's start with her arrival to France. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Ann, a emancipated woman who divorced twice, arrived in Paris following a career opportunity. I just am curious to know what was the France that she saw when she arrived? What, what met her eyes? Well, if you think about the difference between France and the United States, the United States is kind of a puritanical country, right? The mm. idea of the body. We prefer to show guns as opposed to the body. Mm. So the fact that she arrived here and she was able to just let her body be free and be as beautiful as possible in a place like France, I think that's the first thing. That she had the opportunity, it was presented to her, she made a choice. She had to reflect on that obviously overnight, to say, am I going to show my body this way? So I think in France it was an opportunity for her to be free within her body, and I think France gave her that. And I'm not sure the idea of being black at the time, obviously, that was very clear, so there's lots of layers to that. But the idea of being able to be free within your body and to dance and to be free, I think that France gave her that opportunity mm -hmm. at that time. And, um, and Curtis, what was the America that she left behind? But she left them behind an America where she was despised because she was black. As uh, she left an America that was barely 50 years after the Civil War, uh, she left an America that was in the in the throes of of uh, concretizing uh, Jim Crow. Uh, 1898, uh, it, it, segregation was made legal in America by the Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson. She left an America where uh, there were thousands and thousands of black people were fleeing the South with some with just the clothes on their back, fleeing the terror, the lynching, the uh, uh, the horror that was being visited upon them. She left an America where uh, the birth of a nation was the, the biggest hit film in America, which is a, which was a film that celebrated the Ku Klux Klan and denigrated uh, black life. She left an America where. Woodrow Wilson, first Democratic president since before the Civil War, son of a slave owner, uh, racist to the bone, uh, resegregated Washington. She, she left an America where just because she was a girl of color, she was despised. And she, and, and she also grew up in extraordinary poverty where, as a child, she's, she's scavenging garbage cans for food. Uh, she's working for white people in their kitchens at eight years old. Uh, she is living with a 50-year-old man at 10 years old. She's married to a man at 13 years old. She's married a second time at 15 years old. I mean, can't, can't, it's, it's, it's just unimaginable, the America that, that, that she lived in. Uh, that was an America that, was, that permitted this. And, and so she arrived, uh, she, 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 she left a black and white, a dark black and white movie, and she arrived in a color movie, in full technicolor. Uh, uh, Jerry, when she did arrive, she met immediate success. Uh, she appeared topless and wearing the famed banana skirt, but her show to some embodied the colonial times racist stereotypes about African women. And it caused both condemnation and celebration, yet she managed to rise above that, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, uh, you know, I think she was able to rise above it because she was not African. She was a black American. Rose above it in the sense that, um, 
you know, what was happening, you know, someone's ideal of like, you know, colonialism or ideal of like Africans was not really applied to her. So she rose above it and because it didn't really apply to her. I wouldn't say she rose above it like, you know, she rose above it, but it didn't really apply to her. Um, I think that, I mean, and, and you've experienced noted. that sort of disconnect in a way, yeah. uh, sort of the you know, how what you experience here in Paris versus somebody a person of color born in France. Yeah, you know, I can say it's very interesting because I am Nigerian. You know, grew up in Austin, Texas, and uh, you know, when I came to France, you know, I you know, people asked me about racism, and you know, in the beginning, I didn't really feel racism, and you know, sometimes I still don't. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's because it doesn't really apply to me as, you know, someone who comes from America, even though I'm Nigerian, which is sort of extra twisted if we're talking about, like, you know, because you can see, like, I, I'm not from a country that was colonized by the, the, the French. So I think, um, you know, I, I really identify with Josephine Baker in that way because, you know, I'm kind of living my best life in France, you know, and, you know, while last year was going on, while I, you know, BLM is going on, well, a lot of things are going on. I identify with her in a lot of ways because I'm getting attention for what I'm doing and my work. And I, you know, I think it has a lot to do with who I am and where I'm from, similar to Josephine Baker, the way that she was recognized. Next, uh, we're going to talk about her, uh, her situation in the US and uh, J'ai de amour, I have two loves, my country and Paris, she sang in her 1930s song, in the US, Josephine Baker is as beloved as she is here in France and nowhere more than in Harlem. Our correspondents met with some New Yorkers to explore the legacy of Josephine Baker. <laughs> Josephine Baker's love affair with her adopted homeland, France, was a lot less complicated than her relationship with the country of her birth, the United States. Her adopted son, Jerry Bouillon Baker, works at the New York restaurant named after her. He's delighted that his mother will now be honoured with a plaque in Paris's Pantheon. I think she is now recognised mondiale. She has everything done since être artiste, mais être dans la guerre aussi, et puis ensuite lutter contre le racisme, parce qu'elle était noire sûrement. C'est pour ça qu'elle est partie en Europe et puis elle est restée là-bas, finalement. Elle se sentait beaucoup plus libre là-bas qu'ici. In the early 1920s, Josephine Baker came to New York City and performed with the Chocolate Dandies at the Cotton Club in Harlem. Although she never achieved the same level of fame in the US as in France, Harlem historian Dr. John Manan believes she played a key role in the cultural and civil rights movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. There's no plaque to her here at the old site of the Cotton Club, but there's a lot of history. I think she is an icon in the civil rights movement. As someone who used their position to further the cause of African American liberation and equality. She came in 1963 for the March on Washington, and to be one of the people who had made it and was recognized throughout the world made Afro Americans feel we have people all over the world. The autumn leaves. Dr. Manan and jazz singer Terry Davis wish to pay tribute to Baker's legacy here in Harlem. East of the sun, west of the moon, yeah. A few blocks west of the old side of the Cotton Club, 17-year-old Kendall McDowell is on her way to a dance rehearsal with the Harlem X. People like Josephine Baker, they are trailblazers. Whenever we do the dance A Train, I try to put myself back when everybody's at the Cotton Club and moving and performing. This school was founded in 1964 at the height of the civil rights movement by a contemporary of Baker, black opera singer Dorothy Maynor. The year before, Baker had told the crowd at the March on Washington that she'd always taken the rocky path and that she'd tried to smooth it out a little to make it easier for everyone else. At this point, let's cross now to New York to Leona Michelle, a performer and dancer. Leona, thank you so much for your time. I want to ask you, what does Josephine Baker mean to you? And I'm not sure how much of the ceremony you managed to see, but how important is it for someone like yourself to have her life celebrated in such a way? 
Uh, I would like to first thank you for having me. It is a, indeed a privilege to talk and share with you about someone I love tremendously. Um, she means a great deal to me and so many people here uh, in America, particularly black women. She is a symbol of freedom, resilience, and bravery. And she is the reason why I am a creative today as a writer, a singer, and uh, an actress. Leona, so. during the many years in France, Josephine Baker lived more freely and comparatively, much more joyously than any other time. So what kept alive her commitment to the US and the struggle of black people there? Yes, I'm um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, but I believe you're talking about her struggle for uh, black people in America. Did That's I hear right. You correctly? Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. Uh, like uh, Nina Simone and so many others, and uh, uh, Billie Holiday, uh, Josephine Baker was up against the wall, taking the blows, uh, daily blows, uh, being a citizen of the United States of America. Uh, she put in her neck on the line uh, numerous times uh, as a, a trailblazer, a civil rights leader, uh, a civil rights activist. Um, she was willing to stand beside uh, Martin Luther King, you know, and, um, uh, and risk everything, really. And, and I think that's what's really remarkable about her. She was willing to return to a country that did not love her back and did not embrace her and take in consideration the constant battles that we as Black Americans are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Josephine Baker, you know, should be applauded for that. You know, right now we're we're screaming out loud, Black Lives Matter, you know, daily here in America. But the truth of the matter is, Josephine Baker was saying that many, many years ago before it be, even became a saying. You know, she was living that. You know, so I think it's very important that we recognize that. And I applaud the, uh, applaud you for honoring her in that matter. Because in, in you honoring her in that matter, and you are also honoring the fact that black lives do indeed matter. Cheryl Ann, a recent piece in the Washington Post by French journalist and anti-racism activist Rikai Diallo says that Josephine Baker's story is often used to push forward the myth of a republic that is supposedly more welcoming to black people from outside of France than those within. What would you say to that? She's more of an icon to I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? Uh, Leona, this is a question actually to another panellist here in France. Just bear with us. We'll come back to you in a second. I think we're opening up the conversation. I was brought up in, in Newark in New York, and so my aunt was at 125th and Lenox. We always spoke about Josephine Baker. She was elegant. She was wonderful. In terms of being in France, what's happening is that a lot of the conversation about race is caché. It's, it's hidden. And so I think that now there is a way for us to be able to, to speak about this idea of discrimination in a way that's not going to offend other people. Um, but for people like Josephine Baker, we always thought about it. It's something that's always been on our shoulders. And so now this fact that, okay, that, that the president has decided to do this, it's actually kind of, in my opinion, it's kind of a political move. Because talking about feminists, we're talking about color. So hopefully in terms of, I'm into education, hopefully it's going to open up the way to be able to have this discussion and not just say, oh, it's the problem of the United States. There's an issue here, and I think that perhaps, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I think that this is a way to be able to open up the conversation. A jury, um, some critics of the president question the fact that he chose an American-born figure as the first black woman in the pantheon, instead of somebody who rose up against racism and French colonialism in the past? Uh, yes, I know. I've heard this a lot from a lot of people around me. But, and I, you know, I don't know if what I'm saying is popular in any way, but I think any kind of recognition is helpful towards the, the greater cause of you know, black people in France. So while, yes, she was, um, you know, a black American and she was not French and she's recognized maybe before another 
French black person, I think it is a step in the right direction of like, you know, saying that, you know, this is a, a wonderful woman and she's a black woman. And, you know, recognition in spite of racism is, is it, you know, it's recognition in spite of racism. And I think that's important. Curtis, it just so happened that today the far right uh, candidate, uh, Eric Zemmour, threw his hat into the ring for the presidential race next April. And it also comes at a time where racism and immigration very much dominates the political agenda. And as Cheryl Ann just pointed out earlier, some could see this as a political move by the president at a key moment in time. If it is a political move, it's a very important and smart political move because Josephine Baker incarnates, represents every issue that's on the table. She's a woman. Uh, and, and, and she's, she's a woman at a time of Me Too. She's a woman where just, just this week, a very popular political figure has been uh, uh, accused of inappropriate behavior with women. I'm talking, speaking of Nicola uh, Hulot. Uh, number one. Number two, she's black. She's black in a world where blackness represents the other, a stigmatized other, an exoticized other. She's, uh, she's an immigrant. She immigrated to, to, to France. And, and I think about that in the context of the 27 uh, immigrants who just perished in the uh, English Channel uh, trying to reach freedom, trying to reach, trying to escape exactly what Josephine Baker was trying to escape. She was escaping racism. These people, some of these people were, were trying to escape political persecution, looking for all, everybody looking for a better life. She's bisexual uh, at a time when uh, LGP and bi and people are still struggling for, for, for recognition. So, so she, she incarnates all of the issues she lived a life that was a life of look at look at the 12 orphans that she that she adopted two from japan et cetera, et cetera, across across the board so so this is a moment where josephine baker has said to france look look at where we're going look at what we're doing Look at what kind of choices are we going to make? What kind of future are we going to have? Because this is, this, you know, it's, it's almost like the George Floyd mo moment in America when America had to ask itself, what are we going to be? Where are we going to go from now? And France is at a point where we need to ask ourselves, with changes going on in Europe, what are we going to be? Look, France, the real France, I, when I sit in a cafe and look through the window and watch the people walking up and down the street, I'm looking at France. I don't see that France when I look at television. I don't see that France yes, when I go to okay. the cinema. I don't see that France uh, and when I look at uh, uh, the political, the, the, the personage in, in, our, in our political life. And, and that France that we actually see, that's real, we need to then begin to embrace that France because that genie is not going back in the bottle. Yeah. Uh, people have been moving across borders from, for all time and it's not going to stop regardless of the polemics of, the, of, of people like uh, Eric Zemmour and, and, and the others who imagine uh, a France, it's, it's the, 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 uh, uh, there are philosophers who have talked about how you can't put your foot back in the same water again because time moves yeah. on. This universe is, is, is moving forward and we can't hold on to something that, that's, that's old and dead and, and, and gone. And I think, again, Regis Debray, spoke to that when he suggested uh, uh, Josephine Baker to be Pantanas in the first place. Cheryl Ann, your thoughts? Well, again, this idea of education, we can use her as a way to look at history, again, why she left the United States, what was happening in the United States, which is still happening now in the United States, mm -hmm. and hope that France doesn't follow. There are certain things that we need to kind of really be careful about. And so for me, symbolically, Looking at history again, why she left, she left a terrible situation and why she was able to move here, but also what happened to her while she was here. Why when she was in a in, in situation where she was in poverty with her house and uh, the Chateau de Melon, 
Why didn't the government help her at that time? You know, that's, that's a question for me. Why did they refuse to help her at that time? When if she really helped the government, at, at, why was she not supported? So I think in a lot of ways we need to look at history and to make sure that we get the details and to not be able to repeat those kinds of, of things. But Jerry, she was also a feminist at a time when yeah. feminism barely existed. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as as you were saying, you know, we're, at, we're in this time of, you know, Me Too and talking about like, uh, you know, rights for women, equal rights for women. And I think that that is another reason why she's so important. You know, you know, I know this debate about, you know, whether or not she's American, but, you know, she's a she's a woman. Like, that's wonderful. Like, you know, no, no matter where she comes from, she's a woman and she, you know, was, um, you know, fought for women's rights. And so that's why we should, you know, this moment is really special. And and it, you know, brings these conversations back to the table again or continued to have them on the table for us to keep talking about, like, women's rights. And um, I think that's that's another reason why she's, you know, again, doubly important. She's a true feminist. Yeah. Um, the fact, though, that Eric Zimmer chose today to announce his presidency, we don't know whether that was just accidental or whether indeed it was on purpose, but it does reflect, doesn't it, Curtis, and we were talking about this earlier, about the two sides of French society and the fact that we've now come to a key point in history for this country to face some sort of reckoning, if you like, mm -hmm. on dealing with racism discrimination, and also immigration. Mm -hmm. Look, France has taken some, some steps uh, 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 along this way. The uh, Tobira law, for example, which uh, has teeth. It's a law that makes all of this, this slavery and, and all around it, a crime against humanity. And one of the, it's interesting, one of the sections in the Tobira law I think it's section two, insists that these things be taught in school. Mm -hmm. This was a law that was passed in 2001. While in America, we're having a debate about not teaching these kinds of things in school, that we should take, that, that we should take these things out, that we, should cover the, that we should cover them up, that sort of thing. So there's some, there's some, some evidence through, across history that France is making some steps in the right directions. First. Uh, Occidental country to, to end slavery, 1794. Yes, Napoleon reinstated slavery. Yes, it took until 1848 to finally finish it. But the first step was taken in 1794. So th this, 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 there's an idea that was, that was incarnated in, with the First Republic in 1792, this idea of liberty, fraternity, uh, liberty, egalitarian fraternity. That that it's it's a it's a set of clothes. It's a it's a set of clothes that France needs to step into. It's a it's 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 something that France needs to really it's uh, take it off of walls, take it off of of slogans, and begin to really embody that. As the president said tonight, this 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 universalism that's that is that is suggested by this idea of liberty, equality and fraternity. But is not the problem that universalism seems to preclude talking about intersectionality? I mean, that's a word that sends a shiver down the spines of many French officials, doesn't it? But it's also this idea, this is 2021, okay, we have all these laws. When you have a law, you have to make it happen. So we're talking about educators and family to be able to concretely, to concretely, <laughs> to really make a change. It's all about blah, 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 blah. We have to help people to be able to talk about this subject matter in a way that's concrete for our young people. Mm -hmm. Not just make a law. A law, you can write it on paper, but unless you really get people to really understand why it's important to teach a certain kind of history that it's going to help the societies for the republic. Again, in the United States, in a lot of ways, we're going backwards. This is very, very, very sad and very dangerous. And I hope that France doesn't follow that, to understand that to be able to really talk about history in a way that is, uh, I don't want to say real, but concrete, that it's really concrete. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it, has, it has teeth, as you said, yeah. teeth to it. 
and not gloss it over, it doesn't mean that it's going to it's going to hurt some people. But on the other hand, it's going to move things forward. Yeah. That that's my belief. At, at this point, I just want to cross to the other side of the Atlantic oui. and bring in Leona Michelle. Um, Leona. How many young people in America these days know of Josephine Baker? Oh, wow. Um, you know, when I walk through the schools, the, the public schools uh, in New York City, uh, in my region, there are images of Josephine Baker that are along throughout the hallways, in the cafeterias, in the English and music room. She is there. She's alive and well and there. When I was growing up, she was not there. I was not aware. So it is refreshing to see that, um, that she is in the air in New York and, and throughout this country. We know her now. Uh, I remember when she first came on the radar for me is when the Josephine Baker came out movie came out with uh, Miss Lynn Whit Whit Whitfield, who did an incredible job. And, you know, thank goodness for movies like that. You know, that uh, that, that is another way to uh, teach our children, uh, bring her to the forefront and shed light on her story and her importance and her greatness. Um, and I also think that it's important that we own our stories and change the history books and put the truth out there. So, you know, there is a real effort now um, to make that happen. Well, what do you think is Josephine Baker's legacy to people living in the US? I think her legacy really is about preserving uh, freedom for all people, um, liberation for women, resilience, inclusion, being brave. Um, she teaches us that being black is not something that, that should restrict you. Cheryl, Ann, And I think that's a lesson that all young people need to carry forward. Cheryl Ann, what do you think is Josephine Baker's legacy? The legacy is that you, we have to have a vision, particularly as, as black women, particularly young black women. So the project of self-esteem, to be able to, if you have a dream, you have to work on it. Some people will say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this. But mm -hmm. I think that's the legacy is to be able to, have, first of all, have a dream and then to be around people who are going to support you with that dream. Even if it seems outrageous that you have this image, you work on it and you believe in God. God's going to help you. Uh, Jerry, what do you think Josephine Baker's legacy is not just for you, but for your daughter? Uh, definitely to have a dream, as you said. Um, but, you know, my brother writes this, my brother is a poet and he writes this wonderful poem about black excellence. And for me, it's that, you know, to like to see a black woman who is, you know, who is living this extraordinary and, ex and uh, you know, excellent and genius, like she's a genius. Mm -hmm. And so for, you know, a lot of times, uh, what is black excellence is not really celebrated. So for my daughter to see a black woman celebrated as this, you know, genius and, and, and as an excellent and amazing woman, for me, that is so important. And for me, that, I mean, that's her legacy is like to see black excellence, you know, as my brother writes. Curtis? Have a determination uh, and uh, a, a vision and a goal and stick with it no matter what. Don't let the obstacles throw you off track because they're going to come. The reason people climb mountains is because it's hard. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. That's, if it was easy, nobody would go to Mount Everest. Life has its challenges, and to be able to look the challenges in the face, and this is what Josephine Baker did, this is her legacy, to look the challenges in the face, to have the determination, the wisdom, the resilience to say, I will be me and I will make this thing happen no matter what and overcome all of the obstacles, and she, and, and she did this. I mean, she, you know, we talk about when she went back to America, for example, and she performed at a certain place, but what we haven't, nobody's mentioned tonight, is that while she was in America, she went also to a prison in Mississippi to visit a guy, I think his name was Willie McGee, who was on death row falsely accused of having raped a white woman, and she, she went to the prison he asked her to sing Amazing Grace, which she did for all of the prisoners. And then 
when she was on stage in Detroit, she came on stage and she announced that Willie McGee has been executed today. And, and she stood with his family, wouldn't allow, the photographers didn't want, didn't want to take a picture of Josephine Baker with a member of the family. They wanted just a picture of her and she refused to allow them to take that picture. Okay. The whole idea, the thing with the Stork Club when she went to New York, the, the, the reason she got in trouble is because earlier when she was in Miami, Walter Winchell, a very influential reporter, uh, uh, was inappropriate with her and she slapped him. And so when he learned that she was friends with Ava Perone, Walter Winchell began to tell the story that she was in fact a communist uh, sympathizer and he's the one that created this whole business of that she's a communist and, and anti-American, et cetera, et cetera. None of these things stopped Josephine Baker. In fact, they gave her energy. Mm. Curtis Young, I'm very sorry. We're going to have to leave it there. I suspect this conversation is going to continue outside the corridors of this uh, studio. <laughs> Many thanks to Curtis, Ajeri, Cheryl Ann and Leona in New York. That's it for this edition of The Debate. In the meantime, let's take a look at some of the key images of an exceptional life that was indeed Josephine Baker's. Yeah, Yeah.